हेलो हाँ सर भी क्लास हंड्रेड मार्क्स आज तीन रिटर्न स्टार्ट सर हेलो यार उनको बोलो स्क्रीन पे फिर इंट्रोडक्शन लगा दें Okay, uh, please settle down. And once again, can I request you to switch off the videos and the audio? Uh, you can come up on screen, or you can speak up in your turn, or whenever you are required to. Till then, once again, I would request you to yeah, it it, it declutters the data, and uh, yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to this virtual training session on the learning technologies in design and construction. I hope your families, you yourself, and your colleagues across the globe are safe and healthy in these difficult times. Uh, this session is being organized by the Tunneling Association of India (TAI) under the aegis of CBIP, that is the Central Board of Irrigation and Power, in collaboration with. the center of excellence for tunnel studies cets which is a new and a fledgling organization <clears throat> under the aegis of national highways and uh, infrastructure development corporation limited nhidcl i think most of you are aware a brief about the tai although i'm sure all of you are aware you have heard of the tai This organization was formed in, in the year 1976 under the Central Board of Irrigation and Power, and we are a, we are the Indian chapter of the ITA, that is the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association (ITA). Now, when you look at the agenda of this EI, it's manifold, but primarily it revolves around three things: one, to encourage the use of subsurface. Our underground space. Two, to promote the advances in the planning, design, construction, maintenance, and safety of tunnels. And three, knowledge and experience sharing. That's how we are meeting here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we also represent the country. We represent India at the at the ITA and similar forums. We are a single platform for connecting the academicians, the contractors, the industry, the the builders, the equipment manufacturers, the designers, consultants, everyone. We publish reports and manuals, and in addition to doing all this, we also hold a Tunnel Asia conference once in two years. last time we had it in mumbai and the coming year hopefully when all is well we going to have it in goa in the days to come we are going to run 10 to 15 more such technical training sessions we hope more and more of you will join and through this medium i will also request you and your organization to become members or preferably life members of our tai okay a word about i just mentioned the cets i think it will be worthwhile to mention about because this is a new organization if there is anybody here on screen 
anybody from the NHG DCL. I think please can we our compliments to the MD and the staff who have conceived this idea. It is as young as 8th of August. I mean, just it's it just about you can say 10 days old. This is a not exactly a think tank. While while TAI is more on the think think tank, this is a platform again for similar kind of jobs, but they are going to be providing the leadership the strategic advice and the problem solving inputs. As we read about them, I think the focus is the agenda that they've laid for themselves is research and innovation. It is a center for review and modification of the designs, standards and construction methods. And also it is a knowledge center. It is yet to take off on ground and we wish all the very best to this small organization within the NHDCL. And we at the TAI would love to collaborate with them because we have a similar agenda, if not the same. Right, ladies and gentlemen, now it's my proud privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. Haral Wagner. I'm sure those of you who are in the world of tunneling for a long time would know about Dr. Wagner. He's a highly qualified and highly experienced tunnel engineer with the with an experience of more than four decades, and he has worked in, in, in more than 35 countries. Uh, he is basically he's known in the field of tunnel design, construction and consulting. In fact, he's, he's worked in all the fields. He has also been a professor at the Graz University. Those of you know that this is a university located in Austria, and uh, this is one of the very, very prestigious universities as far as the tunneling courses in the world are concerned. He's also the vice president of ITA, International Tunneling Association, and also an expert member of the ITA Executive Council. Uh, we have met him on a number of occasions, and it's always a pleasure to, to hear him and also interact with him. Uh, speaking about the subject matter today, I think you are well aware that the subject matter of the day is basically on the Now, on, on, the, on the tunneling technologies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are aware that with the recent breakthroughs in the tunneling technologies, it permits you a choice of design. Okay? And it permits you a choice of technique. And today, with the more and more experience coming, people want to minimize the risk. So risk mitigation is another aspect. And the contract management is another aspect which I think as engineers, all of us need to be updated. Now, our subject of the day would be dealt on the similar Henry, things. Namaskar, sir. Yeah, somebody stopped, I think. Yes. Can I, can I continue? Control, can I continue? Yes. Okay, I think there was something else, some confusion. Okay. So I, I just left it that OK. When you look at, you know, when you in the field of tunneling, you all know that it all starts with the investigations. OK, uh, a better investigation, a comprehensive investigation leads to a better design and more optimum design and a more economic design and a safe design. Second is the methodology. You know that okay, there are two methodologies basically available. Either you use machines, that is the tunnel boring machine, TBM, or use the age old good technique, which is called the, either we call it as the conventional tunneling method, or we call the new Austrian tunneling method, which we very uh, you know, loosely call as NATM. So today we're going to be going through the designs, construction, risk management, and also a little bit about the business practices centering around the contracts. Now, so much, I don't think I should take more time. Uh, now, I would invite our speaker of the day. Uh, if, if you are, if I'm audible to you, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you very much for this great in, uh, introduction. So I invite you now to, to educate and enlighten all of us with your magnificent experience and your talk. Over to you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. 
Are, are we going to see the presentation? Uh, is it uh, available through your management or uh, is it going to be? Yeah, I, I think we from, can see from the, side. We, as you speak, we can go through the presentation. I, I'm sure. I, uh, give me a minute. Uh, Sunil, if you are hearing me, I think we should when as the professor is speaking, it is better that it comes up on the view foil and then he explains. Sunil. Hello. Yeah, Professor, wait a minute. I think uh, this Sunil, can okay. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. No, 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 Professor, I'm not. I'm, Sunil, I'm calling Sunil Sharma. Hello, Sunil. Ah, Sunil, I think we. we... Yeah, I can hear you. Professor, can you share your screen? I, uh, well, I, I cannot, I can hear you very well, but uh, but there's no picture on, from the screen, you know, there's no no presentation as such. You're, what I'm saying is, can you share your screen? We will see all that. I, I can use the screen, I can open it, yes? Yeah, okay, you take the control, please take the control and share your screen. I have opened the screen now. Yeah, share it. Well, it is on on my screen, but but uh, it it looks that uh, it is not uh, not shared with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we can't see it here. Let me see if our guys can share it here. Sunil, if you are hearing me, can you can somebody here share the screen? Control. Professor, can you see uh, uh, this dialog box uh, in your screen? Professor, can you see this uh, dialog box? Uh, just a moment. Now I, I can see you. But uh, what, what kind of box you mean? I, I don't know what you mean. This down below in the center, no, there's one dialog box where this is red button is there, the telephone uh, uh, sign, telephone sign, hand button is there, hand raise bu button is there. Can you see that dialog box? No, no, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what kind of box you mean. Okay, uh, have you uh, shared your presentation with somebody, with T T T AI? Someone is having your presentation? Mr. Sharma? No, no. Sunil, Sunil Sharma? I, 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 did, I did send the whole presentation to Sunil Sharma a couple of days ago. Okay, so then Mr. Sharma, you can share this file and you can uh, handle the slides. Mr. Sunil Sharma, you can, you can do that. For Professor, <laughs> Professor, uh, in your screen, uh, this uh, MS team uh, screen is open. Which which screen is uh, is open on your screen? MSG? Should 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 I click open share tray? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that that's what. Okay. Screen share. Now something is happening. Yeah, it will come. Yeah, good. Now we can watch your screen. You can carry on now. Uh, <laughs> show, no. 
professor we can we can see your screen now you can continue okay just just a moment yeah uh i cannot i cannot see my screen <laughs> Okay. Maybe we can go like this. Please maximize that one, professor. Hello. हेलो Can can you move the picture? I I cannot see the picture. You know. Now now I can see the the first slide. But are are you going to move the slide? You you can go to slide number. Three already because uh, of the nice introduction we have already received, so I don't want to to talk about that anymore. Anyway, I would like to let you know that I'm excited to be with you today and uh, to give you this uh, virtual lecture. Uh, basically, I will start with uh, the fact that tunnels are. Disputed sometimes, and in particular disputed because of failures. Uh, such failures continue to occur, and they are a serious, uh, serious subject in in the public because the public immediately complains if there is a problem uh, with the tunnel, and we do have ah. to understand that. Okay. Hello. Uh, video. Uh, video. Nahi so we can i think we can continue yeah yeah please continue uh, yeah i wanted i wanted to say that uh, tunnels are always a subject of uh, uh, publicity also and then uh, if we have a problem and the problem can be uh, in any type of tunnel in soft ground or in hard rock uh, and uh, this also has a reflection uh, to the insurance industry, not only to the construction and to the tunneling industry and to the uh, project owners. So uh, what, we, what we have to focus on is we have to focus on uh, a uh, better accident ratio where we have a, a, a quotient between a tunnel uh, failure and between the tunnel of success. So can we go to the next slide? Can, can you move the next slide?
Yes, so the, the, the next slide is uh, uh, about the, the substance of the success. And the success is both uh, a success of the contract and of the ground. So uh, we, we have to have uh, an increase in the capacity, both uh, for public and for private uh, underground infrastructures. Uh, we have uh, uh, worldwide population growth, and this population growth uh, is increase of uh, energy consumption it's an increase also of uh, bettering uh, living standards and that's a global development so uh, the, the dependency between the tunnel and the ground uh, is related also to the ground behavior which uh, is the biggest uh, source of claims and uh, Hello, and resulting in uh, many times in disputes and uh, sometimes also negatively in, uh, in corruption. So it is the subject of infrastructure design, which is influenced by short term decisions. If we, if we dig a tunnel, we, have, uh, we are facing continuous changing conditions underground. And so we have to make uh, uh, very quick decisions. And we go to the next slide. The next slide uh, gives you an idea about uh, the ground investigations, which is, yeah, the ground investigations which have a crucial influence. So uh, this is a kind of a complex uh, uh, slide, which we are looking at here. Uh, where ground investigations are the main desk study. Uh, when we make a desktop study, we also have to uh, look into the literature. In many cases nowadays, we have uh, available some uh, publications, we have uh, available geologic maps, we have uh, topographic maps. We have uh, aerial photos, and even today we also have satellite images. So all this together uh, uh, ends up in the field study, in a field survey, which is a field reconnaissance and also a detailed geologic mapping, which further, further goes on in laboratory testing, subsurface testing, and so on until we, we finally come up uh, with uh, the investigations. Okay, so we have uh, quickly talked about ground investigation and about the crucial influence which uh, ground investigation have. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I have uh, not a clear, not a clear picture here. Can you go to the next slide? Which gives you the uh, outline of the of the lecture today. Can you move to the next slide? Hello. Hello. Okay. Now we have Can you hear me? Yes, yes, clear. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm, I'm just giving a quick uh, overview of uh, the outline of, of the lecture, uh, which is uh, uh, after the introduction, some sample uh, projects, also standards and specifications. Then uh, I will be talking about uh, contracting and risks, uh, about uh, lessons learned and contract trends, lessons learned from failures and contract trends, also risk management, uh, contracting practices, geotechnic baseline report, which is uh, one of the most important documents. And uh, then about uh, different types of risk scenarios. Hello. And uh, some conclusions, recommendations, and uh, final words of thanks. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Professor, you're audible. Please go on. Continue. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Hello. Can can you move to the next slide? Yes, clear now. Please go continue. OK, now we have the next slide. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see the, the whole the whole slide, you know. But anyway, this slide ta talks about uh, a, a big project, uh, which is uh, here in Thailand no. uh, for the for the railway infrastructure. Uh, hello with uh, a, uh, a program of 4,400 kilometers of uh, one meter gauge railway tracks, uh, which is all national railway services managed by the State Railway of Thailand. And uh, it has four uh, main lines, which is the northern line, northeastern line, the eastern line, and also the southern line which uh, will provide a new uh, net for the uh, railway uh, tunnels and infrastructure in Thailand. Can we go to the next slide? OK, so in addition to the meter, uh, gorge uh, project of 4,400 kilometers. There is also uh, a high-speed train uh, plan which connects uh, uh, these uh, southeastern uh, countries of uh, Laos and, uh, and uh, Vietnam and uh, Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand and uh, uh, Myanmar also with uh, high-speed rail lines which are 
1,435 uh, millimeter gauge uh, uh, railways, which uh, would connect Southwest China and Southeast Asia uh, with uh, the from coming from uh, uh, Kunming in the north, uh, which is the provincial capital of Yunnan, uh, through Laos and Thailand down to Myanmar and to uh, and further to Singapore. We can go to the next slide. Hello. Please proceed. Hello. So the, the, the next slide would be slide number nine. So <clears throat> what, is, what is extremely important uh, uh, is that uh, we have to do our design and, and construction based on standards and specifications. And I have uh, uh, made a list of standards and specifications which are common right now uh, for underground works, for the safety of tunnel boring machines, for uh, the construction and geotechnical works, for uh, mine structures uh, for guidelines for fiber, uh, uh, steel fiber concrete, uh, for tube mechanical planning, but also for, for uh, sheet tunneling. So this is a combination of uh, so-called ÖNORM, which is the Austrian uh, standard specification but also uh, for uh, United States, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers guidelines. And uh, okay, so we are on, on number nine now and including also some international standards. Can, can you go to the next slide, please? The next slide uh, gives you specifications according to the uh, European standard, to the German standard, and uh, to uh, uh, railway guidelines uh, for different types of uh, materials, concrete, cement, steel, uh, ground stability. Uh, these are all uh, German norms, DIN norms cement and uh, gives some, some norms also for geotechnic investigation, for ceiling strips, for precast concrete segments, for soil classification and so on. So this is an uh, overview which uh, you will have in your files after the lecture. We can go to the next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide? Now, uh, the next slide uh, gives you an uh, overview of the Austrian standards, B2203. Uh, this Austrian standard is used uh, for conventional tunneling uh, in Austria. Usually it uh, includes uh, tunnel technical terms and in particular, give some examples and also some indication on literature. The next slide. The next slide is uh, a slide which uh, gives you an idea of what it all comes down to during construction. It all comes down to payment lines. And this uh, gives you a cross section from the payment lines for excavation and support before the formation. So when, when we uh, dig a tunnel underground, then uh, we have uh, usually, we have deformations. And uh, this deformation uh, needs to be defined 
because uh, it is uh, uh, the so the the responsibility division. You know, it it is uh, the difference between the responsibility of what the quality of work which comes from the contract and the uh, uh, reaction reaction of of the ground. So uh, you can see here that uh, we have line A1 and line 2 and uh, we have some uh, other, the, the radius also, which is defined from, from the design. So we have uh, uh, these uh, excavation and payment line before deformation uh, in the tunnel and then we have another and in the next slide it shows you on slide number 13 the uh, payment line after deformation. So you can, you can see here also that uh, what is, uh, uh, can be included under uh, conditions of competition uh, during the uh, uh, request for a, pro for a cost proposal from the contractor. Uh, and uh, what you see here is uh, also the, the gray area, you can see the uh, uh, defined by the, by the design, uh, the, the, the radius, the thickness of the lining of the uh, primary and secondary lining, and that's all after the deformation. We can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> The next slide uh, uh, is, an, is an Austrian uh, slide, Austrian standard slide, also defining uh, the crown of the tunnel, which is uh, uh, written in, in German, unfortunately, Fürst, Fürste. And uh, we have the side walls, and we have uh, also in the cross section two different types of cross section on the left side. You can see the, the cross section of, of a tunnel, which uh, has uh, uh, an, uh, an uh, uh, invert uh, part of the rock. And on the right side, you can see the invert, uh, which is a structural invert. Uh, if the ground conditions are not so favorable, then we have to provide a structural uh, invert. So this uh, uh, is uh, a slide which is uh, a definition on uh, the areas of uh, both the crown, the side walls, the bench, and the invert. Can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the next slide shows you what uh, the specifications are. Uh, and what the risk management uh, and uh, uh, what, what is due uh, uh, to uh, different types of problems in the tunnel. Uh, mainly the cost overruns, cost overrun is one of the most common problem. Another common problem uh, is uh, the delay in construction. Another common problem uh, is also uh, the losses, you know, if the construction uh, has a delay and uh, I, uh, I can get some revenues uh, from the project, uh, then uh, there is uh, a, a claim for the, for the revenues of the project because of uh, losses uh, during the time losses during construction. And then we, we have also have uh, a problem uh, if we have safety deficits, uh, and uh, the biggest safety deficit will be uh, if there is a, a collapse. And then uh, we have also some uh, problems uh, which are related to uh, environment and uh, violations of the environment. The next slide, please. Can you move on to slide number 16? This slide number 16 is a very common uh, slide, uh, very well known, because it says that uh, uh, risks can be managed, uh, we can minimize risk, uh, we can make uh, an agreement to share the risk, we can transfer risk, 
Uh, but what we cannot do, we cannot ignore uh, risks. So there is uh, no construction ever free of any risk. There's always uh, a risk in every type of construction, in particular of underground construction. Go to the next slide. Slide number 17. Yes, uh, just last year in 2019, during World Tunnel Congress in, in Naples, uh, the uh, FIDIC Emerald uh, book uh, has been uh, launched uh, and it, it defines underground works, the conditions of contract for underground works. So these conditions of contract for underground works, uh, when it's designed by the contractor according to the reference designed by the employer and the geotechnical baseline report, uh, as I mentioned already, which uh, I consider is the most important uh, uh, document in, in, a con in a contract. So this is uh, done uh, in the... Uh, so-called Fidic Emerald book, uh, which uh, is now widely used uh, worldwide. Can go to the next slide. Well, in this uh, Fidic document, uh, uh, there are general conditions there, are, there is a guidance for the preparation of particular conditions uh, with some uh, annexes, uh, example forms for securities, guidance for the preparation of tender documents, and example for a schedule of baselines, uh, completion schedule and schedule of contract as key element and contract agreement and dispute uh, avoidance education agreement which all uh, should uh, is regulated in this FIDIC document and should be used and should be helpful also for the future of uh, construction contractors of underground works next slide please the next slide uh, gives uh, uh, an overview of current practice uh, in particular, for the project owner views, uh, it uh, uh, raises the issue of current contracting practices, uh, the issues of concern uh, for the for the pro, uh, from the point of view of the project owner, the issue of risk management, uh, then uh, comparing risk uh, examples. Uh, uh, which is also always very helpful uh, in the contract. Uh, uh, so there are more and more examples and more and more we can learn uh, from, from these examples uh, as uh, we, are, we, are, we are facing with one situation that uh, every tunnel is different. There is no tunnel in the world uh, two times uh, or identically but uh, we still can learn a lot from the past. Next slide. Then we have uh, uh, a construction contract abuse also. Uh, the, the contractor, when he starts to prepare a project, uh, he looks, what, what are my concerns? Uh, then he looks uh, into also the, uh, the uh, issue of claims uh, can can I? Uh, is there any door in the contract that I can open a claim? Uh, then the, he looks also into various options because contractors have uh, different experiences, and uh, they sometimes uh, have uh, quite good ideas and like to uh, introduce these ideas and provide an option. The contract also looks into. Uh, risk management principles. How is in my specific contract the risk uh, uh, the, the risk distributed? Who is going to be the risk owner? And then there is a risk management uh, process also. Okay, so that we can go to the next slide.
Well, this is a very critical uh, uh, situation in tunneling of the past, and uh, fortunately of the past. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, we have had a decade of uh, uh, collapses and, and failures in tunnels, where a, a ratio, a loss ratio for the insurance was more than 500%. In, in other words, what, what does it mean, 500%? 500% was uh, that uh, in, in uh, simple figures, if the insurance industry did claim an accumulated value of contract policies of $100 million, let's say, and they had to pay for problems which have occurred during construction, 500% uh, more or $500 million where they had an income from $100 million. This was a very frustrating situation uh, for, the, for the insurance industry. So there was a free, a very uh, high frequency of claims. And uh, so the, uh, the, this uh, loss ratio also was uh, uh, something which uh, was unprofitable and un, uh, unattractive for the tunneling industry, you know. So uh, the uh, insurance industry had to do something against this and they started to develop a code of practice uh, for the tunneling industry. Uh, and uh, just by chance, at the same time, the International Tunneling Association also has developed uh, uh, guidelines for the risk management in, in tunneling independently, both of these institutions from each other. We can go to the next slide, please. So there was uh, a rising concern due to the size of loss uh, uh, and uh, against uh, the premiums from the insurance and the contract value. That will give you an example on one of the next slides. Uh, of uh, uh, what uh, really could happen and could not have uh, could happen in the past and should not happen in the future. We can go to the next slide, please. So there was a, a, a decade of tunnel collapses in the tunneling industry, and you can see I don't uh, mention all of these collapses and problems. Uh, uh, during during uh, that uh, day of decade, but it, it was it was a horrible time, uh, and we have uh, to we have been facing uh, this, and we had to come up with some solutions. So uh, in in the printed uh, version of this uh, lecture, you will find uh, this, and uh, we can go to the next slide. So this shows the uh, Singapore, Met uh, Singapore Metro, uh, Nichols Highway, uh, which was a huge collapse in 2004. Uh, just uh, uh, a few weeks before, at that time, we had a, a WTC, a World Battle Congress in, in Singapore, uh, before that happened, and it was shaking uh, the... Uh, uh, government of Singapore, it was shaking the metro uh, uh, owner of the, of the metro system. And uh, uh, we can go to the next slide and see what uh, really happened after that uh, March collapse. Uh, yeah, you can see here, uh, there was uh, a, a, a collapse of, of, a, of a tunnel which was uh, open construction but ended up in the shaft here. You can, you can see the, the, the shaft uh, uh, still has uh, been stable. But the, the, the problem, uh, and that was just a month uh, later, the problem was that all of this has been indicated uh, with geotechnical measurements, observation method has been applied, but the interpretation was lacking. There was uh, not enough uh, attention paid to these uh, uh, to these uh, monitoring uh, records. We can go to the next slide. 
Yeah, see, uh, it killed four people and caused uh, several millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in damages. So the, the question was, what was the lesson which has been learned from, from this collapse? Go to the next slide. Very similar situation. Uh, we don't have the picture right now, but it, it, it should show, I don't know what happened. It, it should show the uh, Metro Sao Paulo in, in Brazil in an axonometric view. The picture don't show up, I don't know why, but maybe you can go to the next slide. It, the next slide, yes. What was the lesson learned? Uh, next slide, number 30. Well, three, three pictures uh, have been missing. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, just in, in brief and, and only verbally, uh, it happened uh, a very similar situation for the, uh, for the uh, in the aero station in, in Sao Paulo, where also we had uh, uh, excavations uh, near to the shaft, everything collapsed, uh, everything was monitored, but uh, it was uh, uh, it was still a big a big disaster. So the the, the question was, uh, what has been learned from from this? disaster from both of these disasters. Uh, the, the Pinero station disaster was uh, happened in, in 2008. Yes, uh, the, the question was, has the design been approved? Because the contractor has done some uh, some design and the answer to this question is no it it has not been approved then the next question was uh, uh, the question whether the geomechanical model which has been used uh, in the design has been appropriate and again we have to say it has not been uh, appropriate then uh, uh, the question was also regarding the calculations and the simulations have they been uh, completely investigated? The answer was no, it has not been uh, uh, completed. And then uh, where the uh, threshold values, have there been any threshold values and have they been monitored threshold values in regard to the, uh, to the deformations? No, again, no. And the monitoring data interpretation was insufficient as well. So all this uh, gives us the reason, uh, very good reason that uh, a, a disaster, that it has been like looking uh, for disaster to happen. Next slide, please. So the next slide uh, asks uh, the question also, what were the lessons learned in uh, uh, construction? And uh, we have the same uh, uh, answers, mostly negative answers, uh, because the excavation direction has been changed. Uh, the uh, excavation cross-section design has been changed also because uh, they increased the height of the bench. They increased uh, the excavation progress rate, did not watch uh, to the uh, development of the strengths of, of the shot grid. And also they changed the blasting scheme. So uh, there was a, a deficient construction management, deficient quality control. And also there was uh, nobody uh, to stop uh, the works when uh, uh, some of the foremen and some of the people on the site have been uh, sounding uh, warnings. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide?
Alô? Yeah, there is again, uh, the picture is missing. It, it, it looks that you could not copy the, 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 the full presentation because that, that picture did show from the high speed train in the western part of Austria. Yeah, this picture doesn't, does not show. I, I don't know. It, it looks that you could not, you could not uh, copy the, the slide. Face collapse. Well, these are, these are uh, slides which show the face collapse. Okay. Then uh, I don't know the capacity of your copies. Uh, is looks to be a problem. Anyway, what you can see here is uh, a claim example, a claim example uh, from that uh, high-speed train project, uh, which uh, shows uh, the numbers on, on the slide here that the original cost of the civil works was uh, 60 million euro, which uh, gives a cost per meter of tunnel of uh, 7,000 euro for one meter of, of tunnel, uh, including excavation and support. Uh, the chimney collapse, which has been uh, indicated on the slide, which I unfortunately could not show you, but uh, there, was an there was an overburden of 90 meters. And uh, usually people would think that uh, if you have 90 meters of overburden, there cannot be a collapse up to the surface, a so-called chimney collapse. But it actually, it happened. Uh, the length of the collapse was 20 meters. And the real cost uh, of the construction depending on the 7,000 euro per meter for these 20 meters was uh, 140,000 euro. But uh, uh, the claim for the reinstatement of the collapse uh, was 7 million, uh, 7 million euro. So that is, that is a, a huge, uh, additional amount uh, and uh, that uh, uh, summers up to 5,100 percent of the of the real cost. So this this shows uh, how uh, risky uh, underground works can be. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, uh, what is the consequence, uh, the contractual consequence of such a collapse? The, the claim uh, and the claim issues are the reinstatement of the cost against the real cost, uh, the insured claim against the insurer's loss, because uh, this huge amount of, of loss has been covered by the, uh, by the insurance company. Uh, the insurance also has a so-called uh, unquestionable quality control uh, and uh, the tunneling industry uh, has been not consistent uh, in regard to the risk management. So these are the issues of the claim. We can go to the next slide, please. What are the trends in, in uh, contracting underground works? First of all, there is a trend uh, that uh, the risk type construction is increasing. The, the contract type uh, is uh, just uh, that uh, more and more risk is uh, 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 the, the construction industry face. Then there is a trend uh, against design and build contracts. More and more uh, we have designed and built contracts 
uh, which uh, in the old days it was called uh, key turnkey contracts. Uh, now we have design and build contracts because uh, there is a belief that we can save time. Once a, once a decision is made to make a, a tunnel, uh, then uh, uh, there is a belief that design and build contracts will provide faster, uh, faster uh, uh, results. There is a trend uh, uh, for tighter schedules and a trend for tighter budgets also. And uh, there is also uh, a trend uh, for competition. Competition is very necessary, uh, but heavy competition sometimes uh, because of uh, different qualifications of the contract can give us a problem. Next slide, please. There are contracting options also uh, in regard to the uh, claim history, which I did uh, show you, uh, that uh, there are uh, offering uh, insurance policies uh, there are options uh, for insurers. There is uh, an increase uh, in terms and excesses and cover restrictions, uh, which could become uh, price prohibitive. There are tackling issues uh, with the code of practice. And uh, there is also uh, an, 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 an increased need for uh, working uh, closer with the industry, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, uh, scientific works on uh, our universities is not necessary, it's uh, equal necessary, but uh, uh, in, our, in our field of underground uh, infrastructures, we have to work closely with the construction industry. Next slide, please. What is uh, the request from the, in, from the tunneling industry? Uh, it is a, a request to agree on appropriate risk management and ongoing risk management procedures in tunnel contracting. Uh, that's the industry request and uh, I think uh, we are responding uh, quite well to this request. Next slide, please. Risk management principles, unfortunately, again, it looks that uh, this slide uh, did not come through. Anyway, uh, the, 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 the principles uh, in, in risk management are shown here, where, which is uh, prediction, which is uh, design and uh, also managing of uh, different designs. Sorry, management uh, principles in the next slide are shown in design and construction. There is another slide missing. Yes, okay. Uh, man risk management principle uh, uh, re should reduce loss probability and claim size uh, through management, through risk management. Uh, risk management should give uh, a better picture of uh, uh, the risk to the insurer, to the insurance industry. Uh, risk management principle also corresponds with the increase uh, an increase of certainty versus uncertainty on financial exposures. Uh, another uh, risk management principle uh, is that we should create aud auditable trails for insurance uh, compliance. And uh, we also should uh, distribute uh, best practice. I'm coming back to that principle of best uh, practice. Next slide, please. This slide also did not come through, but it's a picture of the code of practice for risk management for tunnel works. Uh, and, and it's basically 
uh, the the ITA guidelines, uh, which gives you a table of content of that ITA guidelines that told you that uh, this uh, also uh, has been has been uh, uh, similarly done by the insurance industry, but. Basically, the, the content uh, starts with the introduction and the scope of the risk management, then the use of risk management, the objective, what is the objective of risk management, uh, risk management in early, uh, in early design stages and risk management during tendering and contract negotiation, risk management in construction and uh, typical components of risk management and risk management tools. Okay, next slide, please. What is the objective always from risk management? Uh, it is the objective to promote and secure best practice for the minimization and management of risk associated with design and contraction in the tunnels, cover, and shaft and associated underground structures. Next slide, please. Next slide. Fundamental prerequisites. Uh, first of all, every partner in a contract, construction contract, should be competent. Uh, uh, risk assessment should be done at each stage of the project. Transparency should be provided. Okay, next slide, please. To assess the, uh, the risk in a risk management uh, principle, we have to first identify the source of the risk then we should identify the cause of the risk. Then we should identify the consequences of the risk. Then we should identify the likelihood and probability of the risk. Then we should identify the uh, severity of the risk and also we should rank the risk. The next uh, slide, please. Risk management practice uh, should be managed to ensure the reduction to a level as low as reasonable practice. That's a technical term used in the FIDIC document. Uh, uh, and in short, uh, the principle of ALARP, ALARP means as low as reasonable practically. We always can uh, reduce the size of a risk uh, by, in, uh, by improving or increasing the strengths of the, of the lining by uh, increasing or decreasing any type of parameter, but uh, we should always do it to a, a level as reasonable practically. Risk assessments are to be recorded and summarized in the risk register. Risk register is part of the risk management plan. Risk assessment means identification of the party which is responsible uh, for the risk. And what, what is the, part, the, the best responsible party for the risk? That should be defined in the negotiations of the contract at the very beginning of a project. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the next slide is the systematic. Risk management is a systematic procedure. Systematic procedure means uh, identifying risks impacting on project in terms of program, in terms of cost, in terms of how third parties are affected. But the same pro uh, systematic procedure we also have to use to quantify the risk and to quantify the cost implications. We also have to uh, identify actions in order to either 
eliminate or mitigate risk and identify methods for control of risk. So allocating uh, risk to the RIAS contract parties is one of the major issues uh, of contracting just before a contract is awarded and the contractor becomes responsible for, for his part of the risk. Next slide, please. So the next slide is an assessment of the vulnerability of risk. And again, it looks that, uh, yeah, this uh, uh, assessment of vulnerability did not come through. Anyway, uh, the next slide shows the owner's view uh, of the contracting practice. From the point of view of current practice, from the issues of concern, from the uh, geotechnical baseline report and risk management plan and risk sharing, and uh, also uh, in particular uh, for risk management of railway projects and uh, uh, also part of contract practicing uh, is uh, uh, studying risk examples from other projects. Next slide, please. That was the owner's view, and now we come to the different types of qualified and unqualified practice. Uh, what are unit rate contracts became very, very rare nowadays. Uh, unit rate contracts in design and construction uh, separated uh, unit rate contracts are tempting to speculation and dispute with new items or excessive quantity variation of uh, existing items. Uh, unit rate contracts are reluctant to allow large quantity variations because of speculative quoting of items. So we have qualified and unqualified practice uh, in the pre-construction stage. And in the next slide, we can see the post-construction. Should be in the post-construction in, in design. Well, the, the picture also did not come through. Unit rate and turnkey contracts require more geotechnical information. Now, uh, <coughs> geotechnical information you know, this is this is kind of uh, of a unwanted uh, uh, part of the contract because uh, investigation costs money, and uh, from the from the most successful projects in the world that we have in International Tunneling Association, we have a quite good uh, overview of that. We know that. Uh, if we spend money for the ground investigation, this is a very well spent money. So uh, geotechnical information is very important during bidding uh, and usually uh, in particular uh, should be uh, uh, applied in hydropower projects. Railway projects uh, have been uh, plagued with huge cost and time overruns uh, that deviate uh, significantly from their value, but not only railway projects, also uh, highway projects are in the same situation. Deviations uh, from uh, uh, contracts might be caused by cultural, social reasons, administrative issues, geological, geotechnical investigation, and so on. So this is in in uh, in design, and now we come to the next slide in construction. Next slide. Yes, uh, in construction, uh, we have found variations between predicted and actual conditions. Usually, we have to manage uh, this. And that could result in significant cost and time overruns, but also in claims due to differing site conditions. Next slide. Qualified and unqualified practice also 
is uh, different, yes. During, during construction, there are <coughs> uncertainties beyond the assessment. Uh, there are innovative, sometimes innovative contractual solutions for quantifying uncertainties and assessments of risk by factors for successful contracting. Unfortunately, the picture is, is missing. Okay, next slide, please. The uncertainties can have contractual, can have technical, and can have financial implications. Uh, risk ownership uh, and responsibility uh, is uh, divided uh, in efficient contracting, in risk ownership and management, and conventional versus bidding versus strategic partnering. EPC contracts versus uh, contracting versus traditional contracting. EPC is engineering procurement, uh, engineering and procurement uh, contracts versus traditional contracting. Uh, it's a uh, favorite contract model nowadays. Approaches for project uh, risk alleviation are made and eligibility and pre-qualification uh, is also an issue of risk ownership and responsibility. Next slide, please. Risk ownership and responsibility. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is the most important part. Who owns, who is the owner of the risk? Uh, and the owner of the risk will have to pay if it materializes, if the material, if the risk is uh, popping up. Risk should be owned by the party with the best availability to control the outcome. So this has to be agreed uh, during contract negotiations and before contracting starts. Uh, a risk uh, uh, responsibility has to be included in the contract as part of the contract to clarify who is responsible uh, for which risk. Now in Austria, there is an Austrian system, we call it Austrian system, which involves a clear risk sharing and risk allocation model. The geologic and hydrologic risk is generally with, with the client. Oh, yeah, and, and, pardon me? And, and what, what is the good reason for that? The good reason for that is that uh, the one who has more time and uh, possibilities to uh, investigate and check the geologic and hydrologic risk is usually with the client. However, the ground behavior risk, including over profile and deformation should be with the contractor. A tumble classification matrix model is used for excavation and support in the Austrian system. I don't know what, okay. Anyway, a risk re register should be included in the bidding document. It has to be uh, developed and being part of the risk management plan. It brings objectivity when comparing line by line risk among bits and forces. Next slide, please. There are provisional needs uh, to define the responsibility between the two parties to provide an uncertainty analysis and also a provisional need is what is uh, uh, already said before, the management of the risk. Now, sometimes we uh, uh, have to subcontract works. And in the next slide, we have uh, an idea what uh, the subcontracting should be within the same project. 
there should be uh, a contract for civil and for hydraulic works and another contract for electrical and mechanical works. And uh, in uh, many cases in EPC contracts nowadays, we have uh, a contract for the design consultant. Next slide, please. When uh, there are several contractors, uh, subcontractors and contractors, then they should, they should interact and cooperate. They should find early solutions at the interfaces between the contracts. They should share uh, common facilities and plan construction activities uh, schedule and agree on the priorities uh, of the employer and the contractor uh, on different priorities. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. The employer and the owner shall take the responsibility for the basic of civil and mechanical works, including all major dimensions of structures and instrumentation layout for the monitoring. And the employer shall also be responsible for the detailed structural and geotechnical design because uh, this is uh, uh, the possibility which uh, he gets offered because of uh, a wider and uh, time-wise bigger uh, possibility to uh, define this uh, design. Next slide, please. The contractor shall be responsible within basic design for carrying out detailed and structural design works but always uh, subject to the approval of the supervising engineer rep or representative of the owner. The payment terms shall be based on approved designs of the engineers and shall always be in accordance with the bill of quantity, which is very elementary. Next slide, please. Okay. The basic design, we already mentioned that. Uh, the design improvement, if the contractor has some options and can offer some uh, savings, maybe even savings uh, uh, subject to the approval of the resident engineer and the geotechnical measures at any loca location of the project during construction remains upon the contractor. Uh, it uh, shall not be taken as a reason for the delay. So the contractor has to do the geotechnical measurement and monitoring during construction. Next slide, please. Okay. During construction, the employer shall or can uh, engage a so-called design consultant <clears throat> which is uh, in, in, in general uh, subject to uh, uh, qualification. And the design consultant shall be responsible for a review of all detailed hydraulic and geotechnical design calculation drawings and so on submitted by the contractor. So the design consultant uh, has a key function in the contract. Next slide, please. The civil contractor uh, has to execute the agreement with the employer uh, and with the electrical and mechanical contractor, uh, which is uh, the contractor selected by the employer. The resident engineer shall ensure schedule for commissioning of the entire project, including electrical and mechanical uh, equipment. I'm talking about uh, hydropower projects uh, in this context, uh, but not only uh, because electric and mechanical equipment we also have in, in highway tunnels. Uh, but uh, the schedule uh, has to be developed jointly uh, with the engineer and the contractor has to support and coordinate all required uh, uh, activities for implementation. 
The same schedule uh, has to be accomplished shortly after signing of uh, civil contract and E&M contract. And the, the design consultant shall coordinate with the civil and hydraulic consultant uh, to ensure adherence to the schedule. Next slide. The next slide just shows you basically what is the function uh, of uh, the risk. The risk is a function of hazards being, uh, uh, being uh, of uh, consequence or severity and likelihood of occurrence. Uh, you can see the, the, the flow of information down uh, at the hazard identification, which is followed by a risk assessment workshop, risk analysis, uh, the risk uh, management uh, in order to determine critical risk and mitigate measures and cost benefit analysis and enact mitigation measures uh, in design uh, and uh, in uh, construction. Next slide. Next slide. Risk ownership uh, shall be prepared for tender documents and the risk shall be grouped into design risk, into geologic risk, technologic risk and in general risk and the risk are to be allocated to the contractor or employer, risk ownership question for suitable consideration by contractor uh, and by the owner uh, at the early bidding stage. Next slide, please. Now, this, this slide uh, defines what is uh, and gives the importance uh, to the geotechnical baseline report. Uh, I'm talking a little bit about more about this because uh, I consider it, uh, it is one of the most important documents in a contract uh, to allocate the RIAS risk during design and execution in the risk register, where, which is part of the geotechnical baseline report. It's not necessary to be provided by the same consultant. Uh, a risk register uh, can be provided by an uh, experienced uh, designer, but the geotechnical baseline report itself defining the geotechnical baselines addressing geological uh, risk should be done by uh, a geotechnical uh, expert. The geotechnical baseline describes the conditions expected to be encountered during tunnel construction. So uh, uh, the geotechnical baseline report represents the uh, employer's best judgment of geotechnical conditions anticipated uh, during excavation. And if actual geotechnical conditions differ from uh, the specified conditions in the GBR, the contractor shall be paid in accordance with the provisions of the contract. So therefore, we make the geotechnical baseline report and we uh, provide this geotechnical information uh, of, uh, uh, of the investigations. And this uh, uh, should be another report uh, called the geotechnical data report or GDR, which should be made available uh, to the contractor uh, during uh, uh, bidding, during uh, preparation of the bid. But the GD GDR is provided for contractors information only, and it is not part of the contract. This is important, the geotechnical baseline report is part of the contract. The geotechnical data report is not part of the contract. It's just for information. And, the, and why is this? Because if the contractor thinks that the geotechnical data is not enough, he can do his own geodata uh, investigation uh, during construction or during contract uh, preparation. 
Okay, the, the picture, uh, I'm surprised that this picture came through, shows uh, the uh, father of, uh, uh, I would call him the father of uh, uh, soil mechanics and foundation engineering, but also tunneling uh, and uh, uh, rock mechanics. It is Professor uh, Karl Terzaghi. Uh, he was an uh, MIT professor uh, in uh, Boston in uh, Massachusetts, uh, before the Second World War. No, before and after the Second World War, because he retired uh, uh, early after the Second World War. Next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide? Yes, this is an important uh, information also, which uh, we have to keep in mind, uh, the so-called differing site condition clause. The uh, establishment of a geothermal baseline for all anticipated uh, condition uh, is uh, a part of the geothermal baseline report. The inclusion of a differing site condition uh, uh, there uh, should also be in, in this report. But uh, uh, any language which disclaims the right of the contractor to rely on the geotechnical baseline report and in the information on the GPR uh, should, be, should be extinguished, should not be allowed, because uh, that uh, would open the door for uh, and, and no, no, no court, no, no judge would, would agree uh, with, the, uh, uh, with a clause which disclaims uh, differing site condition. So this is a very important part that we always should have a differing site condition. And why should we have a differing site condition? Because there is always a rest of uncertainty in any, in any project, in any underground infrastructure project. Next slide, please. Well, uh, again, the uh, geothermal baseline report, GBR, has to establish a realistic basis for all contractors, so they all have the same chance to, to, to work on that. Uh, it should be included in the tender documents, to form the base for evaluation of contractors and for claims in, in uh, uh, particular situation of differing site conditions. The GBR shall help in preparing the risk register on the basis of specified baselines and the risk uh, uh, shall be suitably allocated and uh, between the client and the contractor. So the next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, contractual baselines uh, are the basis for equitable contractual risk sharing and risk allocation between the project owner and the contractor. Next slide. Uh, uh, the GBR is a contractual binding statement. Uh, it is uh, part of the construction contract and it has to be uh, provided in a simple and effective method of risk allocation. It's a contract tool for owner and for contractor to provide uh, uh, the ability to define the level of the risk and uh, the guidelines for the preparation. There are guidelines for the preparation of GPRs uh, and uh, considerable experience, international experience is available. Next slide, please. Can go, yes. Re I'm, I'm just finally talking a little bit about uh, risk scenarios, risk scenarios in planning. Uh, what is What could be a risk? It's an inaccuracy in the survey of the project and in the layout of the project. Uh, there is a risk also in the delay uh, of acquisition of land for the project. Sometimes the project is more or less finished, 
but uh, the expropriation of the land for the project is not finished. Then there is a delay for the acquisition of the land. There is also, it could be a risk uh, in delay, the arrangement for the land, for the facilities of the contract uh, in terms of uh, power supply, uh, access roads and so on. Next slide, please. There are scenarios in construction, uh, in design. Uh, there could be an error in geotechnical or hydraulic design. Uh, it could be a, uh, also a delay in the completion of the structural design. Could be an error in the structural design. And uh, there could also be a non-validation of design during construction. Uh, next slide. Non-validation because conflict with the law, for instance. Next slide, in construction. The risk in construction uh, can come from uh, meteorological conditions, from hydrological conditions, can come from seismic events, uh, can come from uh, unaccessible site, uh, constraint in access to the site, can come from uh, unstable slopes, uh, can also come from the work in riverbed or borrow areas or from dumping areas for uh, working. Next slide. Geotechnical risk scenarios are uh, listed up here. Uh, inaccuracy in geological investigation or misinterpretation, uh, occurrence of hard rock, unexpected hard growth strata, uh, sudden loose fall, squeezing ground condition, chimney formation, as I mentioned before, heading inflows beyond limits, maximum steady state water inflows, occurrence of hot water springs, uh, also emission of harmful gases, uh, methane gases, and occurrence of accidents. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, technological risk scenarios can result from uh, technological breakdown of thatching plants, breakdown of uh, general equipment, breakdown of water and air lines, leakage through coffer dams, non-availability of acceptable foundations in dam areas, opposition by the rehabilities, accidents, strikes, uh, non-availability of explosives, non-availability of water and power supply, and stoppage of works uh, upon the government orders. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, we have seen that already. Equipment risk scenarios. Next slide. So we come to the conclusions uh, and uh, after that uh, to the uh, question and answers. Uh, conclusions are that uh, we need to have regulations and standards because they are helpful tools both for contractors and uh, uh, owners during project development. Uh, in particular, the, the choice of contract modeling and uh, of uh, the technology used in contract is uh, very, very important and needs to be decided from the point of view of test uh, risk coverage. Uh, we uh, can lessons learn from the past, both in design and construction, uh, and they show that geotechnical baseline and risk management plan uh, are very important part of uh, any contract document. Next slide. Next slide. We are coming to the uh, uh, recommendations. And uh, from the point of view uh, of selecting a tunneling technology and the uh, related contract, 
uh, we have to be focused on risks, both in design and construction, uh, whether, whether we have uh, to work in uh, soft ground or in hard rock. Uh, when we do uh, a contract, we should uh, avoid contracts which uh, lead to disputes. That sounds to be very general. But uh, contracting trends in practice show that project owners uh, are, have a tendency to shift to the geotechnical risk of adverse geology to the contractor. This has the potential to be understood as an, invest, uh, as an invitation for unwanted uh, disputes. So uh, we should not uh, uh, look into, into uh, that type of uh, uh, disclaimer uh, in uh, dis disclaimer clauses. And uh, what is most important also is uh, we have to spend money on geotechnic investigations to make use of advanced uh, engineering and procurement contracts. More geotechnic investigations and related expenses are needed than conventional contracts. There is a saying that uh, we have to pay for investigations, for geotechnic uh, investigations, whether we do it uh, before contract award or we do it uh, after or during contract award. So that, that is uh, one important uh, investigation. Spend money on geotechnical investigation. The most uh, successful projects in the world are showing that this is very well spent money. And uh, I can give you uh, examples from uh, Alpine crossing tunnels, both in uh, Austria and in Switzerland, uh, <clears throat> which show that uh, this makes uh, a lot of, uh, there's a, a lot of ratio for geotechnic investigation investment uh, in uh, big uh, underground construction projects. Uh, I'm sure we can go to the next uh, slide. The next slide, which should be a summary uh, of the lecture uh, <clears throat> for tunnel design and construction risks with ongoing increase of tunneling activities in Asia and globally. The risk of tunnel accidents continues and has mostly serious uh, consequences. The potential risk for loss of life and property due to tunnel accidents is still very high both in soft ground and hard rock. And, and uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, remind uh, to the two examples uh, from the Singapore uh, Metro and from the uh, Metro in Sao Paulo in Brazil, which uh, has uh, caused uh, losses of human life and caused uh, several hundreds of millions of, of dollar losses, of money losses. The image of the tunneling industry, including uh, the image of the insurance industry, is always negative affected after an accident uh, and leads to alternative elevated projects for the only reason to avoid tunneling in spite of higher construction and higher life cycle costs. I have shown on several uh, projects, recent projects in Southeast Asia, that it is cheaper it is cheaper to go underground than to go above ground. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I became an enemy of the cement and uh, of the concrete industry because uh, if you look to elevated structures <coughs> for highways, elevated structures for, for railways, elevated structures for metros, you will see that uh, not only the uh, Cons consumption of concrete and, and uh, cement is, is much, much more uh, than, uh, than for underground construction. Underground construction is cheaper in particular, uh, even if we don't uh, take into consideration life cycle costs. Uh, I'm uh, a, a very strong promoter for underground construction for infrastructures. And uh, with regards to the increasing urbanization worldwide. 
Now we have 50% of the world population living in urban areas. In, in uh, 20, 30 years, we will have 60% and more uh, of people living uh, uh, in particular in coastal areas worldwide, uh, in urban areas, and we have less and less people living in the rural areas. It is cheaper to go underground and it is from the environmental point of view also much, much better to go underground. Now, with the help of seminars like the one we have here, we have a virtual seminar, training and education in underground structures within all members of uh, International Tunneling Association, uh, we have set a target to minimize accident and uh, to, to give less, uh, uh, less uh, nutrition to the, to the always uh, uh, fake media. <laughs> uh, I'm using this, this term because many times, if there is an accident in tunnel construction, it's, it, is, it is blown up by the media and very, uh, gives very uncomfortable feeling to the tunneling industry and to the insurance industry. So with that, uh, I, would, I would like to conclude with uh, the question, what, what is uh, experience? Uh, what is experience uh, uh, in uh, underground construction? And I can give you the answer. The answer is that experience is the name given by the experts uh, if, they, if they make a mistake. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your uh, presence and for your attention. I can assure you it was a big pleasure and big honor for me to, to go through this lecture today. And uh, by the end of the, of the lecture, I have seen that even the slides became complete and, and all this, uh, I hope it, it will be uh, in, in the soft copies which will be distributed to the audience it will be complete also. If not, I'm always available uh, to, uh, to give uh, further copies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Harald uh, Firstly, I must compliment you for a, a very exhaustive uh, lecture. And our apologies to you and to the audience for what happened initially on the slide sharing. It seems to be some technical hitch, but as the lecture progressed, probably at least the audio was very clear. And when you came to the subject proper, I think it's been amply covered and very well covered, Doctor. So thank my, you very much. Yeah, so my compliments to you for that. So uh, I think the lessons to take home because your lecture today was primarily focused on the risks and the risk management. So the lessons to take is that firstly, do your investigations adequately and in detail. It saves you the day it saves you money, it saves you embarrassment, and it saves lives. So detailed investigation, like I had said initially, yes, very important. It, and second is the design, because irrespective of whatever happens during the construction, the owner remains responsible for the design. The risk of design, a risk of doing a wrong design is always on the owner, so design, and that's why that during the construction phase, you also have to have a design review agency. Okay, uh, you did mention about that when you talk of risk management, there are three things. One is the design, second is during construction, and third is the contract management. And most of it comes to the contract management because world over, the contractor being driven by the profits looks at those loopholes. And if you have left any, there is always a dispute. To minimize the yeah. dispute, I think, yeah, the, the, the idea is to have a contract which is as well written no harm to the contractor, but it is as good and as well written as it can be, uh, rather than running to the disputes and running into uh, some sort of uh, showdowns. Uh, that's why I think one should follow the best practices. And uh, FedEx has now already come out with a with a book. Uh, we we were uh, we were there at the conference last year in Italy when the book was launched by the FedEx people. And I think more and more of us in the tunneling business, even in India, should start following that. Uh, you mentioned a very interesting point. I don't know how many people caught on to it. Because it's my favorite subject. The, the invariably in our tunnels, especially the long tunnels, highway tunnels, 
there's a mismatch between the civil works and the E and M works. Invariably, yes. there are two different contractors. Well, there can be two contractors. Both are very specialized jobs, but somebody has to integrate. And that part yeah. you mentioned that the coordination of the integration, coordination between the two agencies has to be done, and it should be covered in the contract. And I think the lead to be taken should be the main contractor, that is the civil works contractor. He should be the lead agency to coordinate the works with the E and M contractor, who should be appointed well in time. Uh, you mentioned another very interesting line. At least, uh, you know, we are we are uh, we are used to when we prepare the schedules. We are used to the system of baseline schedule or the baselines. You brought it on a very important aspect called the geotech baseline. Right. I, I think this is a subject which probably uh, me and my very colleagues, well. yeah, uh, yeah, would like to you know uh, study a little more about it. And uh, you also mentioned very appropriately that the money spent on geotechnical investigations is not money wasted. It is a money well spent. It will yes, save you sorry. today. It will save you an accident. It will save you time. It will save you effort. OK, now with that, I'm not going to take more time. I think we have already reached almost the outer edge of our uh, timing. We started a little late. Uh, so the, the house is now open to our colleagues here on the uh, on the net today to ask you questions as many as they want to. And uh, Sunil. Sunil, Sunil Sharma is on the on the line. He's going to handle the question answer session. Uh, where doctor, with because of certain paucity of time, I have another scheduled call at 5:10. So I'll have to leave with the with the uh, you know sort of one thank, hope. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Yeah. Thank now you we'll, very we much. We will connect with you uh, very soon once again. Oh, uh, thank okay. you, gentlemen. Who, those who are on call, thank you very much. And our once again, our sincere apologies for a bit of a technical hitch. Hopefully, when we sit on the next webinar. I assure you this will not be there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your kind words and uh, I look very much forward. Hello. I, I, I'm hearing you. Thank you. I won't leave till, till, till you are on. OK, OK. <laughs> thank you. Over to you, doctor, for the question answers. You may like to invite questions. OK, thank you. I'm, I, I expect some some questions and I will be very pleased to answer. Yes, yes. Maybe Sunil is uh, Mr. Sharma. Yes. I request the participant, those who are interested, to ask for any questions. Dr. Wagner, I am uh, Suyash Trivedi from Mumbai Metro Rail Corporation. Uh, just wanted to know more about your statement. You said that GBR should be part of contract. Whereas yes. GD, GDR should not be part of contract. So right. I just wanted to understand the what's the rationale behind it. The the, the rationale behind this is that uh, the GBR and uh, all the information given in the GBR are are a, a contract statement and they are part of the contract while. The uh, geotechnical data report, GDR, uh, is something which is uh, given for information to the contractor, but uh, it is the, the data in the GDR are not binding, you know, the, the, it, this is not binding to the, to the client, to the owner of the contract, because the, the contractor can say, I have doubt if the uh, angle of internal friction, if the uh, direction or uh, the cohesion of, of the ground or whatever uh, is, uh, is uh, not what, what it is. So the contractor has the possibility to check again and, and make his own uh, geotechnical data report on that. But the geotechnical data given from the owner is not binding and is not part of the contract. So that that's the uh, basic uh, agreement uh, which which uh, has been agreed in the International Tunneling Association and uh, also in in the FIDI conferences in various FIDI conferences. Okay, thank you, doctor. And another thing, I just wanted to know. That's yes. the was was the fundamental difference between emerald book and yellow book. What I understand that in this emerald book, uh, geotechnical risk might have been shifted to employer. 
where is in yellow book this risk remains with the contractor am i right in my understanding and i wanted to know more of, of more from you that was the fundamental difference between the two you know <clears throat> the the emerald book the new book vedic book is specific for underground works and <clears throat> for for uh, underground works basically uh, for mind underground works where where the yellow book is more general so uh, that the reason for the create for the creation of the emerald book was that uh, the yellow book was not sufficient enough specifying for underground works so it is it is uh, i i would call it a more specific and and uh, better it is it is better from the point of view of the contractor and the owner of the project uh, because it uh, defines the difference between the responsibilities of the two parties more detailed and and more clear and gives more information also to additional documents like how to prepare for the geotechnical baseline report how to prepare for uh, cost and and uh, how to prepare for schedules and how to prepare for uh, subcontracts so all that is better formulated in the in the emerald book now i think it's it's definitely a better book so this terminology of gbr comes from emerald book right yes yes okay it okay. is in in the emerald book it is it's a definition thanks, in thanks the emerald book but there there are other guidelines for how to make a geotechnical baseline report for instance the american society of civil engineers ase uh, randy essex uh, very well known uh, good friend of mine uh, also have prepared uh, guidelines for the preparation of uh, geotechnical baseline reports so there are different documents you know in in austria we also we have our our own uh, like i mentioned at the beginning of of the lecture today we have our our own uh, uh, guideline also for the preparation of risk management so there are different uh, countries and different uh, regulations codes and standards for that thank you very much doctor thanks a lot my pleasure hello excuse yes me. hello hi doctor wagner this is om dikshit from telecom excuse me uh, hello 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 this is hi this is harinder doctor wagner yes uh, i i can hear you but i cannot understand very well can you speak to the microphone directly yes i am telling i mentioned on non class you have mentioned on non classification system can you put more light on that i i i still have a problem to understand you know the the uh, transfer of the voice is not not clear can, can you uh once again ask the question uh, and can i can i kindly ask you to speak slow so that i can understand hello in system can you put more uh, uh, on on my phone that on can can i put more on on what on 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 Hunan, I, I don't know what it means. Hunan. Hunan, Hunan, Hunan. Hunan. Ah, the Austrian standard. The 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 Austrian standard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you. What do you like to know? You you like you like to know on on the different. Uh, numbers or or i i is your is your question specific on payment line or or hello i'm asking i'm asking about on system on 
You mean ÖNORM? O-N-O-R-M. O-N-O-R-M. O-NORM. O-NORM. ÖNORM. Yeah, O-NORM. Yes. Can you put uh, more on uh, light on that on on our class? I think I think he wants to say. I think he wants to say O N R A M. O N yes. R A M. Oscar November Romeo Alpha Mike. Yes. Yes. Now uh, the 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 A norm the A norm is uh, uh, these are the, the guidelines for conventional tunneling uh, or CTM tunneling or NATM tunneling and cyclic tunneling or mechanized tunneling or tunnel boring machine tunneling and we have this uh, uh this is B2203 for underground works and then we have an Ö norm for safety of tunnel boring machines. Then we have an Ö norm for uh, uh, construction and geotechnical works. Uh, then we have, uh, we have uh, uh, guidelines, so-called RVS lines for mined construction under uh, structures. We have guidelines for fiber Concrete, we have guidelines for geomechanical planning, for guidelines for shield tunneling. Is, is it that what, what you mean? Hello, Mr. Wagner. Yes. This is Harinder from Mumbai. Oh, good, good afternoon or good, good evening. Good evening. I have a uh, question for you. Please. Uh, how is the risk analyzed for the possible cavity during tunnel excavation? The, Maybe the, it the a conventional the, method or through TBM also? Yeah, both, both for, for conventional and for TBM. Now, <laughs> the, 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 the risk basically is defined in the Geotechnical baseline report and in the risk register, which is part of the geotechnical baseline report. Now, uh, that, that risk starts uh, first of all with the uh, best estimate for the uh, amount of deformation. We have some, some deformation. Uh, of the of the ground when we make when we dig a hole into the ground regardless uh, of the uh, technology then we have a deformation because of stress release we have we have a, a transfer from the primary stress condition to the secondary stress condition and this stress transfer goes hand in hand with deformation is, no. it, is it during excavation or I, I mean what what will how will it be analyzed when we are in the middle of the excavation? I mean somewhere in the middle of the tunnel. Uh, the yeah. same TBM also and uh, both. Atom also. We, we, we have a, a <coughs> distressment in front of the tunnel face, in front of the tunnel boring machine or of the conventional excavated tunnel. We have a distress uh, condition, uh, which is uh, uh, part of the deformation. You know, this is pre, pre, in, pre excavation. Then can we probing, have can probing help in this. Pardon me. Can probe drill, uh, probe drills can help in this? Sure, sure. Probe, probe, probe drills always pre investigation ahead of the of the excavation. Uh, always helps to understand, and uh, if if we have if we have uh, conditions where we have uh, an increased uncertainty of the geotechnic condition, because uh, maybe sand layers or silt or clay layers or whatever, which How we don't expect. Pardon me. 
How far can we go for a pro drill in front of the face? The, the, the minimum should be 10 meters. Uh, the maximum usually is 20 meters ahead of the face. Okay. So, so that, that helps in preparation of what uh, we have to expect. Mm -hmm. And what are the mitigations for the cavity, fulfillment of cavity? If, if there is a cavity, first we have to understand who is responsible for the cavity. Is there responsibi responsibility uh, to be allocated in the geotechnical baseline report means uh, a responsibility of the owner of the project, or is it responsibility in the ground behavior, whereas the ground behavior depends on the uh, skills and on the experience of the contractor. Okay. So and after, after we have, after we, uh, have uh, uh, allocated their responsibility, we can say we will do what, what we need to do. Uh, and depending on the size of the cavity also, is, is the cavity uh, half diameter of the tunnel or is it um, more than that? So it, it, it depends on, on what, uh, whatever. Can, can it be mitigated by freezing the ground or uh, overground? Freezing is one of the most expensive uh, ground improvement methods. But uh, usually if, if we have soft ground, if we have water, and uh, if we don't have uh, too much gravel, uh, which will uh, make freezing more, more uh, complicated and more expensive, then freezing helps. Yes, yes, freezing can help. Uh, what other than freezing we can do if it is an expensive? Grouting. Grouting, you know, de Grouting depending, with chemicals? On, depending on the, on the permeability of the ground, uh, different types of in injection grouting will for sure help. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So nice of you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, this is yes. Good evening and. Hello. 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 Good evening. I am Doctor Nathani from Manalam, Bengaluru. Uh, you have you have another question? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much, sir. We, it was very nice presentation on this uh, regarding the underground. But now I am having a one question uh, regarding the GVR. Actually, in India, we have a practices of the making a PFR and FR in the DPR. In few projects, in few projects, of course, GVR also. So, experience, what you are suggesting that it is it will take a part of the DPR or it will be a separate part. We have to go for DPR also, and again, we have to go for the I, I understand your question is uh, focused on the GBR, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you you have you have a practice in India that uh, uh, geotechnical yeah. engineer with experience and competence will provide the geotechnical baseline report. Yeah. And you have you have that in Nepal also. Yes. So so what I'm telling, sir, in India, generally we are making DPR detailed project report. Yes. So whether in place of the DPR, detail project report, we should start telling GPR, geotechnical baseline report? The geotechnical baseline report should be developed in parallel to the ground investigation and also to the preparation of the project. Correct. Oh, oh, okay, sir. And from your yes. experience, sir, regarding this, regarding the second, my second question, sir, regarding EPC, EPC contract and BOQ contract, the from your experience, whether we'll go for EPC or BOQ? Well. <clears throat> 
the base of an EPC contract also has to be a bill of quantities. So the, the, the bill of quantities uh, is the result from the design, because in the design you will, you will define uh, the thickness of the lining, you will, you will design the size of the opening, you will design the construction uh, uh, progress and the construction uh, concept, uh, multiple drift or single drift project, and everything de depends on, on the design. So as, as a result from the design, you will have a bill of quantity. And uh, in, the, in the EPC contract, in the uh, uh, engineering and procurement contract, you have to have a base design also. So the, without base design, you cannot make an EPC contract. In the EPC contract, you have the base design and the detailed design will be provided by the contractor, respectively by the uh, design consultant uh, from the contractor, subject to approval of the resident engineer as the representative of the client on the site. Okay? Uh, so so uh, uh, there, is, there is an overlap of responsibilities uh, from the point of view of different stages of the design. You have an early stage design, you have a final design uh, for the base design, and you have a final design for the uh, detailed design during construction in an EPC contract coming from the contractor or from the design consultant of the contractor. So, uh, sir, sir, in case of EPC, yes. Risk will be shared by client and the contractor, or only by the contractor. No, risk. The, the risk the risk will be shared between the contractor and the client. And the very simple understanding of the risk sharing is that the uh, uh, risk for the ground behavior is with the contractor, and the risk for the geology. Uh, is with the with the client, okay? okay so uh, the the contractor has to provide a quality of work based on his competence and experience, and the client provide the information on the geology, hydrology, and uh, on the baselines uh, of that in the G, in the GBR. So uh, when we have uh, a deviation from the GBR, if the baselines defined in the GBR are not matched with the conditions on, on the site during construction, then this is the responsibility of the, of the client. But if the deformation is high, if the contractor has provided uh, a bad quality of work, bad contract, uh, if, the, if the profile, if the accuracy of the profile uh, is very different uh, from the design, this is the responsibility of the uh, contractor, uh, including also the geotechnical behavior, the geomechanical behavior of the ground uh, expressed in the deformation. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Sir, good evening. I have a question. Please. Uh, sir, you have shown uh, some sets of uh, specification and standards in your slide 9 and 10. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, because uh, for the sim uh, similar type of activity, there are a number of codes in different countries. Say you yes. have shown Austra Australian specifications. There are American standards also. Yes. So when we are doing in a uh, we uh, when we are doing a work in a country where these uh, specification are missing, they don't have any their own versions. Then there will be a contradiction between the contractor and the client. If client while writing their contract have specified some certain uh, certain specifications, say they have adopted from 
Australian one. And if contractor is free to have, uh, say, TBM from Japanese standard. So he will come up with the, the standards and following with respect to Japanese standards. So whether international association are working to have a uniformity in these specification and standards so that it can be followed and there will be no contradiction during contract management. I understand. <laughs> now, let me tell you. In fact, we have uh, in different countries different standards and sometimes if there is no standard in a country, there is uh, usually the use of other standards from other countries like European norm, European uh, standards or American standard or Japanese standard or even Chinese standard, you know. Yeah. So uh, this should be agreed before uh, the, the contract is signed, which standard becomes part of that contract. If the, the client suggests uh, Japanese standard for a mountain. In, in Japan, they call it mountain tunneling, you know, mountainous tunneling. So uh, if the, uh, the, 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 the client says Japanese mountain standard is the standard which is uh, applicable, the contractor has to either accept that as a condition of contract or he can also say, I don't agree with the Japanese standard. I would like to apply American standard or Austrian standard or whatever. But the, the standard has to be agreed before the contract is signed so that there is no dispute and no contradiction during execution of the works. OK? OK, sir. Means, uh, means this thing has to be finalized at the pre-award uh, pre of the tender. So that Absolutely. There be no contradiction. Absolutely, there cannot be a contradiction. And if the contractor wants to have another standard during construction, he only can uh, can uh, have this other standard if the client did agree. Then the client say, okay, you want to have American standard or you want to have British standard. I agree, you can use British standard and then uh, the, the contract will be based on British standard. But it has to be agreed either before or afterwards, but uh, it is easier to agree before and then no change can happen. Oh, thank you. Sir. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Haral. Uh, yes. This is Adar Shamas from Central Water Commission. Glad to meet uh, you. Yeah, uh, I have a doubt regarding uh, overbreak and excavations. So, okay. is there any uh, range of uh, geologically acceptable overbreak in different types of rock in terms of percentage? And if also any standards or guidelines available for which we can refer it to uh, preparing contracts and also in the BOQs? Thank you. Yes, this uh, touches the question of the payment line. Now, the, the, the overbreak <clears throat> has to be defined in the geotechnical baseline report. It is very important that the geotechnical baseline report includes uh, 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 the measure for the, for the overbreak. So the, the contractor can say, OK, I agree with this overbreak as it defined in the geotechnical baseline report. Or he can say, I don't agree. If he does not agree and he thinks that the overbreak will be more than it's indicated in the geotechnical baseline report, then the, the client can say, OK, if you think you will have a more overbreak, you have to include this in your price. But I'm not going to change my payment line. In the, in the design, the, the design in, and uh, also in the Geotechnical Baseline Report says how much the overbreak acceptable to the client is. Okay? If, if the contractor thinks this is not enough, it's okay. He can, he can think like that, 
but then it is his risk and he has to include it in his price. He can say 100% more or 200% more than uh, in, in the, the geotechnical baseline. He can do that, but he will not be paid for that, and he, but he can include it in his price. That's, that's a, always a permanent dilemma, you know, the, the contractor has, and that's where it is shown whether the contractor is competent and experienced or not. Uh, is there any uh, standards available uh, such that anywhere it is written that this much should be the percentage of ore break in this type of rock? There, there is experience from literature, yes. Uh, a standard as, as such uh, only uh, is theoretically and uh, in the in the picture which I show on, on slide number, I, I think, nine or, or ten. Okay. On, on slide number 12 and 13, you have, you have uh, the indicated uh, measure for overbreak before and after, okay? But this is, this is more schematic. Actually, the experienced author, the, the consultant uh, or the geotechnical engineer on, this, on the consultant side, you know, he has to give his measure of the overbreak. And he can say in, in uh, uh, depending on, on, on the rock, is it a highly fissured rock and jointed rock, or is it uh, a, a clay material, uh, whatever, limestone or whatever it, it could be. So there, there, are, there, are, there is literature available, but basically it has to be defined by the geotechnical engineer, the one who is preparing the geotechnical baseline report, and he has to say, okay, we have this, this type of rock, we have this type of underground here, and I estimate so much overbreak, 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter, or whatever, uh, and, and that, that will be part of the contract, the contractor can, can uh, put it into his price. That, that's the way we handle it in, in, in our contracts. Okay, thank you very much, Harald. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, doctor, doctor, good evening. Good evening. Doctor, good evening. I'm uh, Colonel Deepak Patil. I am a uh, uh, general manager for a uh, tunnel being made in the Himalayas. It's a 4.5 kilometer long tunnel called Silkiara Tunnel. And uh, I'm the general manager over here. We have uh, done about 1.5 kilometers of work in the last 1.5 years, one and a half years. I've got a question. Uh, it's, it's basically related with the, uh, the, with the subject uh, in which you, you, you had given the presentation about the EPC contract. Now in India, we have uh, generally have uh, for these um, uh, underground constructions, we have uh, EPC contract. And this primarily does not cover the uncertainties. So my my uh, my suggestion is that uh, see in a in a tunnel the primary support lining is generally same throughout. If if the primary li lining is the same, uh, the thing what what is varying um, is is uh, basically the the uh, the, the events which are going to happen. Let's say there will be some overbreaks. Now there should be cost, or there should be a method catered in the contract which should cover those overbreaks. And second is uh, the most important fact is that uh, if if the rock is poor in a particular tunnel, the time required to construct that tunnel will be more. So are the contract if it caters for that time dependent cost, then I think this contract will cover almost everything because the cost of the primary lining or the primary support system. Is generally the same for everything. So we have it as a uh, as an item rate or a fixed rate. And uh, for the uncertainties or the overbreaks, uh, we have a measurable uh, quantity that is item rate. And the third is the time dependent cost. If the tunnel is constructed in a in a speedier manner and in a faster pace, then the contractor is paid accordingly. If the contractor is not able to move forward 
uh, in a speeder uh, in a speedier uh, pace then he has to be compensated for that because he is putting his manpower he is putting his machine for those very number of days extra days so if he is given his dues i think the contract will be the most ideal and the most balanced contract uh, and I did not really uh, hear your question very well, but I will tell you what I understood. I understood that you have a five kilometer long tunnel uh, and you drive this tunnel in the conventional tunneling method, correct? Yes, NATM method, yes. NATM. And what is the size of the tunnel? What kind of tunnel is it? Is it a railway tunnel or a highway tunnel? Or it's a it's a highway tunnel and it's uh, uh, it's it's got a diameter of thirty point five meters. Okay, so it's a two lane highway tunnel. Yes, exactly. It's a two lane highway tunnel, and now we are converting it into a a bi uh, a unidirectional tunnel with a separating wall at the center. Okay. So uh, hello. It, it it is it is a bi directional tunnel. Means in in both directions you have the traffic. Yeah, I mean, it will be a one-way traffic. Uh, in, uh, at at each uh, each section, only one uh, uh, single tra uh, lane traffic will be allowed. I mean, there will be no chances of collision in the tunnel. So it's That's about 100 point. square meter excavation area. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, the, 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 the question is, the overbreak, because you use uh, for the primary lining shotcrete and maybe you use some uh, anchor bolts and, and welded wire fabric, depending on, on the rock quality, uh, you have to, to install the primary lining, correct? Yeah, I will, I will repeat my question again uh, in a very uh, shorter time frame. Uh, what my suggestion was that in India we have uh, contracts which are generally EPC contracts and uh, even the underground structures are covered in these EPC contracts. Can, can, you I, speak, can you speak a little bit slower so I can better follow what you say? Yeah, I will, I will speak a little slower now. See, and in India we have... To the micro. Yeah, we have a contract system called EPC like you had told in the beginning. Now in right. this EPC contract, uh, all these underground structures are also covered. Now, the, the, the EPC contract does not cover the uncertainties, which happens in an underground uh, uh, strata. Why, why it doesn't cover the uncertainties? The EPC should cover the uncertainties. No, it is not covering because it is a lump sum amount which the contractor has quoted. And when he has quoted this lump sum amount for a particular strata, if that strata doesn't come, then the contractor is bound to uh, go into losses. So if it goes into do, losses... Do you, do you have a geotechnical baseline report? Yeah, we have a report. Uh, we had a TPR made prior to the contract. But uh, um, unfortunately, the rock which we are we are finding is not uh, the, uh, similar to the what uh, it was done in the TPR. So, so you, uh, you need more support. You need more support. Yes, we are needing more support. And we are going much more slower than anticipated. So you have rock class classification, okay? Yeah, we generally have uh, support class three and uh, sorry, support class four and uh, support class three. That's all. So in the support class three and four, uh, we are going at a very slower pace. Uh, so the but contractor is losing a lot of money uh, on the time dependent cost. The time dependent cost of primarily uh, the machines manpower of the special manpower is applying. So what I what I wanted to ask you was that if we bifurcate our EPC contract into three parts, the first part will be a fixed primary support for which he will quote a, a lump sum amount and we will pay him that. The second part will be the uncertainties. Let's say there is an overbreak. Let's say there is a, a chimney formation, unfortunate uh, incidents. For that, we will give him, uh, uh, we will pay him on the uh, item rate contract basis. And the third will be the, will be the time dependent cost, uh, which will be paid as as the speed of the contract. I mean, as to the speed of the contract. Okay, so you are you are the client. Yes, you are the client. Okay. Uh, 
<clears throat> you know, to, to give you a, a good answer, it is really necessary to understand the details of the contract. And, and uh, well, I can, I can tell you, you have the primary support and you have the overbreak and you cover the overbreak with the short grid uh, of the primary support because you have to work on that. And the primary support uh, is slowing down the progress rate per day or per week or whatever. Uh, in this, in, and you had uh, the contract that did give you, or you requested the contractor to give you some progress rate per day or per week in the uh, rock classification three and four. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, the, the progress is slower than, than uh, the contractor did give you. Exactly. Okay. So the contractor is claiming because he cannot make that, that progress, uh, which, he, which he has uh, offered in his, in his bid. No, he is unfortunately, uh, I mean, he cannot claim anything because it is a EPC contract and the contract conditions don't allow him to do this. So, but, but finally, what will happen is the contract contractor, if he if he goes into losses, uh, the, I mean, as a client, I will not get the tunnel in that time frame, and uh, it is a possibility that at at such conditions, the contractor may even abandon. So, my question was that we should have a contract which should not be fixed. We should have we should have variables in the contract. There should be a time dependent cost. There should be a fixed cost for the primary support. And there should be a, a, a methodology catered uh, for payment uh, of the uncertainties. I mean, this is what is my suggestion. Well, <clears throat> is the contractor using proper equipment? Is the contractor uh, using uh, experienced teams who work in the tunnel? Uh, is is the quality of the lining uh, corresponding to the specifications? Are the deformations within the limits which are defined in the geodetic baseline report? So these are all questions which need to be answered in detail in order to come up with a conclusion and, and uh, uh, in order to get a successful project done at the end of the day, you know? So... Uh, okay, understood, Dr. Understood. I, I... Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Just, just one minute for me. I'm Dr. G.T. Patel, Security General, Turning Association of India. So yeah, can, can you can you speak? Can you please speak close to the microphone? Because I can hardly hear you. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm GP Patel, Security General, Tanni Association of India. I think this question answer will not end today, sir. People have got many questions. So see, my request is let the participants send their questions to us. We will compile them. Then we'll take up with Dr. Wagner and then we will reply them accordingly, sir. Okay, very good suggestion. Thank you. Very good. Okay. At last, sir, it was a wonderful program, sir. I like to thank all my around 160 participants. A special thanks to Dr. Wagner for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, you know. About and this participation certificate. Sir, we will send all these certificates and PPT to all the participants by email. So thank, thank you. Much, I think we can close the today session here only. Thank you very much. We will meet thank you day. very much. I really appreciate it. I, I feel blessed and, and honored uh, to be with you through this virtual conference today. And I think it was a very, very good uh, uh, seminar. Thank you very much for your attention. There was, a bit, sir, there was a bit problem. 
in the i t initially later it was modified for next time i assure to all my participants and you there will be absolutely no problem thank you very much so now thanks to all everybody who ever are associated with this program thank you all thank you thank you sir is dr sharma still here